When the plane came in, he was flying from this direction. He was scud running, flying just underneath the cloud level when he came in and impacted on the mountain. Unfortunately, there was no way that they were going to live. This, of course, is part of the nose of the bomber. Here's the number of the aircraft. Absolutely unbelievable. One crash in particular, which is it's very tragic. Uh, crew took off. Very early morning flight, it was dark. They were going to fly to the south. There was a little bombing range in Sarita. They were going to make practice run, drop a few practice bombs, shoot off a few rounds with the 50 caliber machine guns, and then be back for breakfast. On the return leg to Davis Monthan, they somehow overshot the field and Tucson, and they kept flying. And unfortunately, at some point, they flew into a mountain range and were all killed. That plane wasn't found for about two months. They searched all over Arizona. They even searched in Mexico. They had absolutely no clue as to where this B-24 bomber had disappeared. Damn, here's a lot more debris over here. By looking at all the shredded shards of aluminum out here, um, one can only imagine what actually happened uh, with the pilots and the crewmen themselves. To give you some idea of the size of this thing, this is only one-fourth of the the actual prop. One thing of interest on this is the camouflage pattern on the outside. It's the tan pinkish hue, which was so prevalent in the Mediterranean Theater of War. It requires a lot of stamina and a lot of endurance to get to these sites. You have to understand that these were young men in their 20s. Some of them didn't even know how to drive automobiles. If you look at the numbers from 1941 to 1945, 6,000 aircraft were lost. Well, we just found our first rattler. So we parked over here. We've been hiking up these washers. This is where where life ended for two guys. But this would be the point that my life changed. Until this point, I had a father. After this point, it was just me and my mom. It's about the people. These men had lives, they had families. If there's a personal item of some sort that we can we can return to a surviving family member, then I think in a sense that it's a memorial to them. I mean, it's amazing to me that, that the whole thing happened, that there's a plane crash and my father was on it and it happened right here. And, you know, I don't know how many people get to walk into that kind of a situation. He's bound to find something. When I heard from Trey a couple years ago, it was kind of hard to believe. I had been by this area like five years ago, but I really had no idea where it was or how to get there. And I'm glad that uh, he got up here and found the dog tags. I'm glad I have those now. So it's kind of important to come here today and see this and uh, some closure to it today. It's nothing more than just old scrap aluminum and steel, but it's the human element that I feel that's the most important. I'm really grateful to Trey. This is, you know, more or less a once in a lifetime opportunity. And without him, it never would have happened. <laughs> Trey found one of my father's dog tags up at the crash site. Then again, the, uh, the bad part is we did, you know, we did find some human remains up there. So Richard was literally at the spot where his dad died. It's one of the most tragic events in Arizona aviation history um, in the sense that 16 men died and it left roughly 30 kids without a father. There was a shroud of secrecy as to why the planes crashed. So lots of families who I contact are really surprised when I say, yes, I have a copy of the crash report. Not only do I have a copy of the crash report, but I know where the crash is. I've been there. <laughs> 